you. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. So I would like to just tell you a little bit about my journey, kind of how I got here. That was a great intro. Thank you very much, Cedric. I appreciate that. Um, so as far as who I am and kind of how I got here, that intro did give you a little insight into that process. But really, that's kind of my, my focus for today, is to discuss you know, my journey. Um, not so much because it's all that important for you to know that about me in particular, but I think that as students who are on your own educational journey and trying to figure out your next steps, it might be helpful for you to be able to see that the process of getting to where I currently am was a slow and meandering journey. It was not something that just happened overnight, and um, it took a lot of effort to get there. And I feel like, you know, one of the best things that we can do for ourselves is to, to realize that we're never done, you know. We're always continuing to grow. We're always continuing to learn. And if you can approach your life in that way, then, you know, you're, you're always going to be moving forward, even if it's not the most obvious straight route sometimes. It meanders around, like I was saying. Um, that's definitely been my experience anyway. So that's kind of what I want to talk about a little bit today. So while you are listening, if you would like to sketch, we do have some sketch paper out. You can just doodle along. Um, one of the reasons that I think that that is important is, at least for me personally, it actually helps me concentrate to be able to, to sit and sketch and doodle things. So whenever I see people who are sketching and doodling in class, I'm like, oh yeah, they're a visual learner. That helps them concentrate. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute here. But just so you know, there is that available to you. If you would like to grab some supplies, you can, you can grab some paper and pencil. So, a little bit about me. Um, as we're going through this presentation, I will be showing you some pictures of me from my life, um, kind of as I was growing up, but also I'll be showing you some artwork that, you know, just so you can kind of get a sense of what I do as a visual artist. I'll talk a little bit about that, but mostly I'm going to be focusing on my actual, you know, journey to getting here. So a little bit about my, my background. I was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, and I was an only child until I was 13. When I was 13, my sister Vanessa was born, and when I was 15, my sister Carla was born. So there was a a big age gap between between us. Um, so I, I kind of helped raise them to, to a certain extent. But I did grow up with my cousin, and so this is my, my cousin Mandy, that's me with the, with the chicken, and my cousin Paul. Um, they were the closest thing I had to siblings as I was growing up. And um, we're still close today, so they're, they're great. My parents were both science teachers, so I grew up in this very educational and scientific household. Um, my dad was mostly focused in biology, but pretty much any of the life sciences, that's kind of like what their educational background was in. And so I spent a lot of my, my childhood just being out in nature and kind of exploring, learning the names of the plants and animals that were in the surroundings. So I did grow up more in like the suburbs of St. Louis, but I spent a lot of time out in the, the wilderness in different parts of Missouri because we'd always go on hiking trips and camping trips and things like that. Um, since both my parents had summers off, we were able to do that sort of thing. So, you know, most of our trips were, were just, you know, tent camping, <laughs> nothing too exciting, but I loved those times and they really were a huge influence on me growing up. I also spent a lot of time out at my grandparents' farm. So they, they have this, um, this property that my aunt and uncles own now that is kind of outside of Columbia, Missouri. So I spent a ton of time out there running around in the woods and just exploring, you know, catching snakes and salamanders and stuff like that, um, frogs, all sorts of things, pretty much anything like that that I could interact with, I just loved. It's like my favorite thing to do. So science has always been an influence on me just because, like I said, that's kind of was my, my family background, that and education. 
But my approach to that has always been through the lens of an artist. I've always been an artist. I can't think of a single time in my life where I didn't want to create art. It was just this innate thing that just came very naturally to me. So there I am in the woods with my grandparents. They had this big pond that they always had some bullfrogs and things like that in there. So I loved, loved catching those guys. So there I am with them. Um, piece of my artwork, kind of inspired by that area. So it wasn't all smooth sailing. I was diagnosed with learning disabilities when I was in the first grade. Um, it became pretty obvious when I started school that something wasn't working right with my brain. Um, my first grade teacher told my parents that there is no hope for me. I was never going to learn how to read. I should just be sent to a special school district and let them deal with it and try to help me. Thankfully, my parents did not listen. They, they were like, okay, we need to figure out what's going on. And so they um, invested in tutors and helped me find my way forward. You know, both being educators, I think that helped as well. But, you know, they were focused on, on older kids. They taught you know, eighth grade, high school, things like that. So when I was younger, I think it was, it was kind of a constant struggle. But my learning disabilities include an auditory processing disorder, executive functioning disorder, dyslexia, and dyscalculia. And for those who don't know, dyscalculia is kind of like the dyslexia for numbers and math. So, it's pretty obvious that with all of those things going on, school was a real struggle for me. It did not come easily. I hated it, to be honest. I absolutely hated school. I loved learning, but I hated the way that I was being taught because it did not make sense to my brain. And it was really a struggle for, for most, of my, most of my childhood. It was a constant thing. I would go to school all day. None of it would make sense. And then I would go home and have all this homework that still didn't make sense. And then I would have to just figure out how to teach myself a lot of it. And my parents did help me and tried, you know, to, to figure out the way that my brain works so that that would help as well. But it was a constant struggle. So school was not, was not easy for me. A couple of things that did help me through art, being out in nature, my pets, I absolutely love animals. My family and friends, they all helped me survive and get through it. So art was really my outlet, and it was really the only thing in school that I actually excelled at. It was just the only thing that made sense to me. You know, it was a way that I could communicate. And because of that, it was something that I pursued from a very early age. Because it was therapeutic, and it was like this escape, you know? So I would go out camping or on hikes, I would bring my sketchbook and my colored pencils and my watercolors, and I would just sit down and draw the things that I saw. You know, I would draw my pet, I would draw whatever, just anything to kind of give myself that outlet, that creative outlet. So, little digress. I love this picture. This was when I was about three years old. I think it kind of perfectly summarizes who I am from a very early age. So, in this picture, basically, I was brought to a pet store by my parents, and they had two animals that you could pick to, to hold and play with. The rabbit was one option, or the snake. And as you can see, I picked the snake. I don't really know why, but I like snakes. I always have. And I don't know. I just think it's kind of funny and um, very fitting with just kind of who, who I've always been. <laughs> a little bit out there, but that's okay. I think that's a, that's a good thing. And yes, I am Slytherin House in case anybody's curious. So because of the fact that my parents were both science teachers, I spent a lot of my childhood around scientific stuff, scientific supplies. I had my friend here, Mr. Bones. This was... Um, one of the, the skeletons that was in my dad's biology lab, 
classroom. So, you know, I grew up around all of this, like, lab stuff. And that becomes more relevant later on as I started to, to become more of a professional artist and figure out, you know, what am I trying to say with my art? Like, what am I really trying to do? I started to incorporate things like that, um, test tubes and, and petri dishes and things along those lines into my artwork down the, down the line. So I've got some test tubes with some, some of my art in here. Um, you know, it was just totally normal, though, to, to spend time around this stuff. That was just kind of my, my background. And I really enjoyed it. And I think it was very beneficial. I mean, actually visiting Colorado, we did some camping up kind of around Estes Park in that area. I know you're not supposed to feed the wildlife, but, you know. <laughs> I was young. So because of my learning disabilities and the fact that I struggled so much in school, I did have a lot of anxiety and depression. And I think it's important to, to mention that because, again, that's something that I struggled with and, you know, I continue to struggle with. It never really goes away, but you can, you can find ways to deal and cope with it. And I think that that's, that's what I've done. But I think it's worth mentioning because, again, you know, when you, when you look at the grand picture, you don't really see those little stumbling blocks and those things that you have to overcome. And we all have them. You know, we all have those, those little things that slow us down or try to get in our way. And, and finding a way to deal with them and cope is, is key to, to moving forward and being successful in your life and whatever that looks like for you. Thankfully, I did have my really supportive family and friends, and they did what they could to, you know, help me and support me during that, that time. Um, eventually, I learned how to work with my brain instead of against it, though I would say it took at least until about halfway through high school, maybe even to like junior or senior year, before I really felt like I was starting to get how to learn. <laughs> um, and at that point, it's like, oh, well, now I have to figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Like, what's next? And that was kind of a terrifying thing because I knew I wanted to do something with art because that was my thing, but exactly what and how and where was all open-ended. And I just, I didn't know, I didn't really know what was going to be next for me. So I applied to schools and got into Maryville University and got a great scholarship there. And I was able to, to start taking my art classes and all my, all my basic education classes. And so I knew I wanted to do something with art. And I started off with graphic design. I was like, no, it's not really for me. I thought about interior design. I was like, no, not really. I thought about just general studio art. And I was like, well, you know, what about, what about teaching? Because I hadn't had a good teaching, you know, a good learning experience. And a lot of my teachers growing up didn't really understand how to teach me because of my neurodivergence. So I was like, well, maybe I could go forward and try to help people who need that creative outlet like I did and try to be the teacher for them that I had wished that I had had. I did have a couple that were helpful along the way, don't get me wrong, but the majority just didn't really get my brain. And I didn't know how to explain how my brain worked to them. So it was kind of just, it was like we weren't speaking the same language. So that's ultimately how I ended up in education. I went to Maryville University and got my bachelor's in art education. And I was really proud to graduate with honors and through their honors program. It took a lot of hard work and it was, um, I still feel like it was a significant accomplishment, especially considering when I was in first grade, my teacher said that, you know, there was no point in even trying to teach me how to read. So, um, so to get to that point, I'm still proud of that. I feel like that's something that I still celebrate because it, it was a victory for me. So I started teaching kindergarten through eighth grade art after graduating, and I did that for a number of years. I did some other stuff between two, um, and ultimately, 
you know, while showing my own work and kind of doing that and doing the teaching full time and doing a little bit of both. But I decided that I really wanted to do college. I was like, you know what, I feel like that's where my, my emphasis should be and where I can excel and kind of get to that deeper knowledge of, um, of helping college students with their, their upcoming careers, whether that's in the fields of art or anything else. Because I do feel like art is very helpful for everyone, even if you're not going to have your degree in art. Taking any type of art class, or any creative classes at all for that matter, really do help you with some of those, those skills. They, they teach you, you know, communication skills and how to express yourself. And um, it's, it's not the sort of thing that is always taught in school. You know, it's kind of some of those soft skills that maybe aren't as apparent. But I think having that creative outlet has been so beneficial for me. And so that was a big part of why I wanted to teach art, is because I knew how valuable it had been for me. And if I could help pay that forward, then that was going to be my goal. So also, while I was deciding to go to grad school, um, I was just continuing to struggle with my mental health. Um, thankfully, I was able to, to seek some help and get some more things figured out. I was diagnosed with PTSD in 2013. I think part of that PTSD was, was having struggled for so long and not really having um, some of the, the supports that I had needed in school. Um, there was other stuff to it too, but that was definitely a factor. So I realized that I couldn't just deal with that on my own. And so I got some help and started to get, to work through some of that, which again, it never really goes away, but you can, you can find your way back out from those situations. And then in 2014, I, started grad school and realized that I was really struggling getting everything done, reading all the hundreds of pages of stuff that we were supposed to read every week. And I was like, man, I thought that I had kind of gotten past some of this stuff with my learning disabilities. I thought I was, I had figured a lot of this stuff out, you know, and I was, I was, hmm, how old was I, 31, something like that. At the time, so I was like, man, what is going on with me? And I was getting really frustrated. So thankfully, when I was at Boise State in grad school, they had some really good mental health supports and supports for, for academic stuff. And I was able to go in and get tested for ADHD. And guess what? I have really, really bad ADHD. Um, I was, had this little clicker and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm eating this. I'm doing great. The end of it, they're like, yeah, yours is, it's, it's pretty severe. I was like, oh, okay, well, good to know. Once I learned that I had ADHD, it was like this revelation. And then, like, I was happy because I had another, like, reason for why I was constantly struggling. And the more I read about it, the more I was like, oh my gosh, this is me. How come nobody noticed before I was like 30 some years old? So then I got mad. <laughs> I got really mad because I was so frustrated. And I was like, this system really did not help me through the vast majority of my education. I had to do all of this stuff on my own. I had to figure all of this stuff out. It wasn't even until I was into my you know, early 30s before they figured out that I had something as significant as ADHD that had been holding me back the whole time um, on top of my other learning disabilities. And once I had that knowledge and I started some medication, it was like, wow, things are easier. This is amazing. I bring this up not because I want to, you know, criticize so much, but because I think it's important for us to have these discussions that if you're struggling with something, go talk to somebody, you know, don't wait because 
if you feel like something is wrong and something's not working for you, there are support systems out there. Sometimes, though, you have to be really proactive in order to get the help that you need. And it took me way too long to figure that out. Um, and it makes me wonder sometimes, you know, how much more would I have been able to do sooner if I had had that help from earlier on? You know, if they had diagnosed me when I was in first grade with ADHD and been able to start dealing with that at a much earlier age, how much that would have potentially helped me in school. So I think we need to have more conversations about this in education. And for any students out there who are watching or listening to this, just know that you're not alone. Um, I was always told not to talk about this stuff. You know, it's embarrassing. It means that there's something wrong with me. It's showing my weaknesses, that vulnerability. We're always told, avoid that. Don't be vulnerable under any circumstances. Don't show weakness, you know. And then I realized after I was mad and after I finally kind of moved through that, that this could be something that I could do to actually make a difference in the world. I could start talking about it. I could write about it. I could not be quiet about it and just hide it. And so that's what I started to do. And I didn't know if it was going to backfire on me because in my whole life I've basically been told that if you tell anybody about this stuff, it will backfire. You won't be able to get a job, you know. Everybody will treat you badly, all this stuff. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go for it. <laughs> I'm tired of not talking about it. I'm tired of pretending it's not a thing. And so in grad school, I decided to write my thesis on my brain and being a neurodivergent person. So this is showing some of my art installation from my thesis project. So it was called Influence. Art, Activism, and Identity as Seen Through a Neurodivergent Lens. So this was my MSA thesis. So I had two components to this project. One was this really large scale installation that shows my interpretation of the neurons in my brain. And then the other aspect to this was my written thesis. So I had to do all the research. And so I, I read all this stuff about the brain and how it works and neurons. And my interpretation of the neurons in my brain are, you know, they're not really scientifically accurate because what I was trying to do was show that interpretation of what it feels like for me. So I had this whole installation full of light and color and it was all about my experience. And I realized as I went through all of this, this whole process of kind of self-discovery and working on this project and doing all this research, that all the things that were different about my brain were actually potentially superpowers. You know, they could, they could hold me back, but they could also push me forward. They gave me a, a unique way of viewing the world. And as soon as I realized that and was able to embrace that, then it kind of just opened up this whole other realm for me that I hadn't really thought about. And I think starting to have those, those conversations about my struggles instead of trying to hide them was a key part of that kind of transition into thinking about it in a more positive way and not thinking of it as being a detriment, but thinking about it as like, you know what? <laughs> Why don't we talk about this more? Why isn't this something that our society can learn to adapt to? Why do we, as neurodivergent people, always have to be the ones to adapt? Let's make things easier to work through for everybody. And that was really what my thesis was about, and kind of my whole philosophy of teaching ever since then. So I did graduate with my MFA in Visual Arts from Boise State University in 2017, another really big accomplishment that I'm super proud of. Uh, it was not hard, it was a three-year constant battle through to get that degree full time. Um, it's a lot of work, but it was, it was very much worth it in the end. And I'm so glad that I pushed myself through, even though it was really hard.
So, as far as the things that inspire me, I'm still inspired by the same stuff that I always have been. I still love nature. Most of my artwork is still inspired by nature. I think it's being out anywhere where I can be with plants and animals and quiet and peaceful places as an introvert really helps me um, recharge my batteries a little bit. That's my my bird, Molly. She more adopted me than I adopted her. She was just a, a wild bird that I befriended when I was a kid. She inspired some artwork as well. So, a little bit more about my family, because they've also been a really big influence. So I have some family ties to Guatemala. They also, my family has always been an inspiration as far as my art, my life, you know, they are, they're always encouraging me. So I had my aunt, uncle, and some cousins that lived in Guatemala. So the first time I, I got to visit was when, right, right around the same time as when I got diagnosed with learning disabilities, actually. And then, like I was saying at the beginning, my sisters were born. So when I was 13, Vanessa came along. She is right there. Also over here. And then when I was 15, Carla came into the picture. So having such a, a big gap between us in age was sometimes a struggle, <laughs> but it was also good because I, I got to kind of be like a second mom some of the time, which was probably more pressure than any, you know, 13 or 15 year olds should have taken on for themselves, but that's okay. Ultimately, it all works out. So, this is my cousin that I grew up with. My youngest sister over here is Carla. This is my middle sister, Vanessa, and her husband, Jeremy, and their little boy, Mateo. He's the cutest. So cute. All of them still live kind of in the St. Louis area, so I don't get to see them as much as I would like, but I go and visit when I can. And we have other ways of communicating, obviously. There's lots of technology that helps with that. Then the other big influence in my life and big support system has been my husband. So this is my husband, Bob. We've Robert. Call him Bob. We got married in 2006, and he is also a professional artist. He's very talented. He does all sorts of amazing stuff, mostly smaller paintings and um, photography, some mixed media stuff. And then when we moved here, we, we bought a house. We adopted a dog. So this is our dog, Willow. And then about a year after that, in the middle of COVID, we decided that Willow needed a friend. So we adopted Indy, that, that little guy right there in the middle. I always say that he's my heart running around outside of my body. He's just the best. There they are when they were little. And today, that's beautiful. So, what I hope you can take away from all of this is that it's okay to be vulnerable. As scary as it is, putting yourself out there can be one of the best ways to move forward, especially if you have had trauma. Um, I tried for a long time to run away from those things and to kind of pretend they weren't things that I was struggling with, but it wasn't until I realized that I didn't have to do it all by myself and that there was stuff out there that could help me, resources and people who cared, that I really started to, to flourish in my life. And so, you know, I think, be happy about your accomplishments, you know, and don't give up. And for those of you who are struggling to figure out what's going to be the next step in your lives, it's okay not to know. It's okay not to have all the answers. If you can figure out 
even a couple things that really work well for you and use those as your foundation, you know, your interests, your whatever support systems you have in place in your life, those people that you can count on and trust, you're going to do fine, you know, and having that perseverance, I think maybe um, it's kind of like you you need to to continuously get mad, maybe, you know, every once in a while you just kind of have to get that little push, you're like, you know what, this isn't working or this isn't right, what can I do to change the situation? What can I do that's going to be the betterment of of myself, my community, my life, whatever that might be, my family. If you can find those things and find those outlets and find those things that work for you, then you're going to be fine. And, you know, life is definitely a journey. And I'm very happy that mine is continuing. And I don't know what's going to be next, and we never do, right? But I think if you can approach it from this angle of being excited about the prospect. And having, not being naive, but having a certain amount of hope for the future, you're going to be, you're going to be better off. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you all so much for listening to my talk. Really appreciate you all, and I wish you all the best. If you are interested in asking me more things in private, or um, if you have questions about your own journey and you need some, some help or guidance, I am very happy to do that. So just come and find me and let me know. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.